Everybody's happy to be here. We're glad that you're here. Um, if you're new here again, I want to say welcome. We're happy that you're here. Uh, we're a little weird, um, but that's okay. We love Jesus, and that's what it's all about. Uh, we're going to finish up a series that we've been working on this morning, and it was called The Big Butts of the Bible. And it's pretty funny because it makes you think of one thing, but what we're talking about is when somebody was traveling in one direction, and then but God did something in their life and sent them in another direction. So the first week we talked about I was blind, but now I see. The second week we talked about the story of Zacchaeus um, and, and how he ran, throwing off all shame to, to see Jesus. We talked about the third week we talked about the story of Paul and Saul, how, how Saul became Paul. And he was on the road to Damascus, but God did something extraordinary. Then uh, last week we talked about ordinary men, how Peter and the other disciples were just ordinary men, but after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they became powerful uh, in their speech and their uh, demeanor about who Jesus was. And this morning, we're going to talk about uh, Jesus. We were all dead in our grave. We were lost without hope, but Jesus is the, the subject this morning. Uh, so let's pray real quick and then we'll jump into this. I want to talk about, Father, we are so grateful that your son, that you sent your son on the cross. We're grateful for your for love and mercy. We're grateful for sacrifice. This morning we're here to celebrate and to worship that. Lord, help us to open our ears and open our hearts to your spirit right here in this place. We give you permission and we ask that you speak directly to us. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about today. Today is Easter. The, the first truth of Easter is, if you're following along in your bulletin and you want to keep up with your notes, the first truth uh, about Easter is God chose us. Or you could say God chose you. If you want to make it personal, you could say God chose me. Say God chose me. God chose me. Think about this. God doesn't need us. He doesn't even have to, but He wants us. He loved us. He chose us. He chose from the very foundation of the world that you were worth redeeming. If you don't get any other message this morning, you were worth redeeming. That was His choice. Lots of people question the love of God. Some leave it completely to chance. Others go by feeling. Others go by if they get answers to their prayers. Uh, that's their litmus test. If he answers yes, then he loves you. If he answers no, then he hates you. Others go by circumstances and on how life unfolds. But the truth is, if Easter does nothing else, it proves God's unwavering love for us. The question this morning is, when did Christ die for you? Now, I don't mean historically, you know, Good Friday, duh. <laughs> no giggles there? <laughs> Not looking for a date on the calendar. What I mean is, what were the circumstances around it? Why Easter? Why did he do what he did when he did it? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you want to turn there. We're going to be Romans chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, we'll definitely have everything up here. But what we're going to talk about here is this is a letter written by none other than who we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Paul, the Reformed Christian murderer who became a great evangelist and author of many books of the Bible, wrote this book of Romans. <laughs> this persecutor of Christians turned evangelist gives us a little bit of insight about the heart of God. And it also presents us with this morning's but statement. So we'll get there. Uh, Romans 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have been made right in the, God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. Undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. I want you to see a key phrase here in 5, 1 and 2. It says, right in God's sight. 
because of Jesus' death on the cross, everything is changed. Everything is restored. For those who choose to put their faith in Him, Paul is not referring to some feeling, subject feeling, subjective feeling about whether you feel good about yourself or whatever. He's referring to an objective status in Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the status changes. Once you were separated for God, from God, and now He calls you His friends, His children. The status has changed. Not your feeling, not your emotions, nothing about that. It's about the status. Then we're going to move on to five. Three through five, it says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Everybody say amen. <laughs> this is the first time you've amen that one, right? Let's read that again. We can rejoice too. Yay! Trials. Amen. Do you get up in the morning and say that? <laughs> Try it sometime. Maybe it'll change the way your day goes. Anyway, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strength our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. Isn't that what we all want? Is that all the stuff that we're going through won't ultimately lead to disappointment? For we know how dearly God loves us. Because He had given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. Here's where people get hung up, though. We hear rejoice in our suffering, and we tend to stop. Uh, we don't want to go any further. Uh, wait, suffering's bad, right? But what if it isn't all bad? This isn't saying we should rejoice because of your suffering. But it speaks of the ability to rejoice in the midst of your suffering. Even though you're suffering. You know, uh, Good Friday is all about Christ's death and suffering on the cross. But a lot of times we as Christians, I think we get caught up in that so much that we forget about Easter Sunday as the resurrection and He's back and all that suffering is over. And that one day we will participate in the resurrection physically. But you can participate in the resurrection right now where you're at. You don't have to wait till death. It doesn't mean you won't suffer. But you can rejoice in the midst of it because you know how the end comes with His triumphal entry again. Because we know that suffering is not meaningless. God is using it to mold us and to shape us and to strengthen us, to produce character that we might, uh, might not otherwise have, to pr produce, uh, to prepare us for all He has planned for us. That's what it's about here when He's talking about this suffering. So, when did Christ die for you? I'll ask that question again. And we'll look at Romans 5, 6 to answer that question. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, 6 says, When we were utterly helpless. Christ came at just the right time. And died for us sinners. I like how Paul writes us there. He came at just the right time. <laughs> Why, what are we celebrating at Easter? That Christ came at just the right time. Some translations say the fullness of time. Galatians 4, 4, 5, 4 through 5 says, But when... 
the set time had fully come, God sent his son. Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. <coughs> Do you know Christ's coming is the central event in history? When we say it's just the right time, what do you mean? So much of our calendar reflects it. Everything is B.C. What does that stand for? And then A.D., what does that stand for? Say it again. Right, in the year of our Lord. What is that? The year that Christ was born. Even your calendar. This is the year of our Lord, 2019. All prior time looks forward to the event of Christ's birth. And all following time looks back at the event. God sent His Son at the perfect appointed time to save mankind from our sins. Why was that the perfect time? We ask, why? Why was that the perfect time? Well, there were many historical realities at play that make it the perfect time. Uh, the time of peace under Pax Roma, Roman uh, occupation had given a time of peace. There was a common language. There was an amazing system of roads, uh, perfect for the segment of time to spread the gospel, perfect timing for political reasons because Caesar had claimed that his son was a god, but the real son of God came. The real son of God came to say it was, but, but it was also the perfect time spiritually. And that's what I want to talk about the rest of this morning. Spend a lot of time with this. We've got to wrestle with what we made and made it the right time. And we're going to go back to Romans 5. The, the first reason spiritually it was the perfect, the perfect time was it was a time of our deepest need. Now most people would not be willing to die, Romans 5, 7 through 8. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God could have sent Christ at any time He wanted. It's not what he did. He sent him at the right time. Romans 5. Consider John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus at our time of greatest need when nothing but the death of Christ would help. If Christ wanted mankind to improve, if he waited for us to improve ourselves, we would still be waiting. Anyone here perfect? <laughs> no hands? Come on. Anyone here far from perfect? Hey. Is it a time of our greatest need? That is what Easter is all about. When we put our hope and faith in Jesus because it's no longer based on us anymore. For those who think that we might deserve heaven, let me remind you what God's Word says about it. It says we are helpless. We do not have the capacity for perfection in us without Christ. Ephesians 2 says, dead in our transgressions uh, and our sins. John 3 says, unable to save ourselves. 2 Corinthians 4 says, blinded by the God of this world. That's so we can see the light in the gospel. Romans 3 says we don't have, we don't naturally seek God. Romans 5, 6, we're, 5, 6 says we are ungodly. Romans 5, 8 says we were sinners. This is who we are without Jesus. We don't have any hope.
You don't have to be a believer, though, or religious. You don't have to have any church background. You don't have to know any fancy terminologies. You don't have to understand anything about the Bible to know the truth about yourself and about me and about mankind. We are in great need. We are a hot mess, as the term goes. Left to ourselves, we tend to lead to destruction. You don't have to know much about anything spiritual or the Bible to see that every day you turn on the news. Question this morning. You write this down if you want. What is your hot mess? Where in your life are you a hot mess right now? That's the beauty about Resurrection Sunday. It's a do-over. It's a start-over. It's a, hey, I am a sinner, and I need Jesus moment. What is your hot mess? Write it down. That place where you feel your life is out of control, and you are in great, God, great need of God's intervention. And as you do that, I want you to know that you are not alone. We just asked if there was anybody in here perfect. And none of us wanted to raise our hand, so we're all a hot mess, right? From the very beginning of the world, uh, Genesis 3, mankind has been rebelling from God. And from the very beginning, God intended to redeem mankind through Jesus. How's your heart towards God right now? This is where I'll get personal for a minute. Do you have a bad attitude towards Him? Are you working hard to ignore Him? Or to push Him out of your life? Tends to, tends to, tends to get a little bit emotional when you start letting Him in, right? And it's sort of hard to look at yourself in the mirror. It's sort of hard to look at all of your shortcomings. But guess what? That's exactly where He wants to meet you. Not because you're good enough, but because He loves you. Do you not have the desire to worship Him like you feel you should? Are those things maybe true in your life? Guess what? God is still offering you grace, and Jesus still died for you. And this might be the exact right time in history for you to finally get some things settled. Commentary about Romans reads, Two ways of looking at the time of Christ's death are combined here. He died at the time when we were still sinners and at the time that fit God's purpose. The second way emphasizes that the atonement was not an afterthought. Do you understand that? It wasn't an afterthought. This was the way God always intended to deal with sin. He did it when He chose to. So in the grand scheme of ages, Christ's death was right on schedule. The next thing we got to look at here, the way that we know it was uh, spiritually the right time was... It was the time that most demonstrated God's amazing love. What do you mean, you say? Back to Romans 5, 8 through 9. All this stuff is in there. Just have to read it. Romans. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us. From God's condemnation. The worst time in mankind was the best time for God to demonstrate His love. And the worst situations of your life is also the best time for God to demonstrate His love. It was the best time for God to demonstrate if God loved us so much that would, He would give His Son. 
and He would do that for us in our worst state, we begin to get a little taste of the true depth of His love. What are you talking about? You say, okay, think about the person that's hurt you the most deeply in your life. That one that you still have those feelings for that you don't want to talk to them or see them because they were the worst person that you could think about. And then choose to die for that person. That's the state we were in when He died for us. Start to get a little taste of the depth of His love. We talk about His love all the time, but we let it roll off of our tongue and we don't really think about what it truly means that we were dead in our sins and we were sinners and we deserve death. That's the heart of the Easter story this morning, everyone. Easter proves it. Everyone out there is looking for proof whether God loves them or not. Easter proves it. Easter shows us the heart of God. To share the cross is to see the heart of God. I mean, to stare at the cross is to see the heart of God. To stare at the cross is to see the depth of His love. To stare at the cross is the, begin the biggest but in the Bible. But God showed His grace and love for us while we were still sinners. This phrase, but God, I've been talking about it for about five weeks now, has been the theme of this series, but it's also the theme of the Scriptures throughout. Did you know that it appears in the Scriptures 584 times, always saving us from ourself, always bringing us hope to the helpless? Over and over again we see the truth of the Scripture that God loves us in spite of us. Not because we're good enough. Psalm 73, 26 says, My help may fade, my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are, but God has shown us the way to be right with Him. Romans 3.20. But God so rich in mercy and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. Ephesians 2. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. 1 Peter. 1 John. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if you do sin, we have an advocate. I could go on and on, but all I have to say right here is I like big butts and I cannot lie. <laughs> Seriously though, we would never be in this life but for God's grace. What would have happened to Adam and Eve, or Moses, or King David, or the disciples, or the robber on the cross beside Jesus, or Paul, Saul, or Zacchaeus, or the man that was born blind? Where would we be without grace? This is the truth of Easter. Again, if you get nothing else this morning, I want you to get this, that God chose us. And Easter proves that without a shadow of a doubt. It's not based on our track record or our performance. It's not based on the way we've acted or didn't act. It's not based on anything that we might deserve or that we think we deserve. It's based on His love for us. Christ died for you when you were weak. 
little quick side lessons here that I would like to add in there that we're going to do communion together. So having known all this that Christ chose us, how does that translate? Because we always talk about application, right? We always talk about you can come here and you can hear the words and you can get excited about them. You can whoop and water and praise amen and all those things. But if you don't go out of here and do something, so what can you do? What can you do to, to apply the lesson that you've learned this morning? Here's one. Christ died for you when you were weak. Show compassion to the weak. Those that you think don't deserve grace and mercy and a second chance and to hear about the message or to feel God's love. That's exactly what He's calling us to. That's one way that you can apply the message of Easter in your everyday life. Why is it hard for those who have been forgiven by Christ to forgive others? That's a question we should ask ourselves with this lesson. The next one is, Christ died for you when you were a sinner. Forgive those who sin against you. That's another message that we can get from the cross this morning on this Easter Sunday. Jesus came at the perfect time. Right when you were grateful for your word, we're grateful for what it it means to us. We thank you how it's uh, opened our minds and our hearts to to um, your message. Lord, help us n not to leave here this morning unchanged. Help us to carry this message of hope and resurrection and love out into the world. And. Help us not to forget about it when Easter is over, but that it's every day of our lives we give you praise and glory and honor for what you have done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.